This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disk Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, Mr. Ted Landau is back, uh, as he, he is every so often, to uh, kind of share wit, wisdom. Um, I, I think we did that last time, Ted. Wit, wisdom, intelligence. We need another, we need another W, so it could be the three Ws. Yeah, that, that would be good. Um, we'll work on it. Yeah, that's, that's going to be one for the thesaurus. Um, so a couple articles you've written recently, a couple things that you're working on, a couple things I wanted to just sort of touch base with you. But the first thing is that you were nice enough to share um, a lot of your vacation photos uh, with with all of us, which is nice. And it makes me jealous because now I want to go up the West Coast. <laughs> well, it was great. Yeah, actually, I, I, I strongly recommend it. It was absolutely a fabulous vacation. I think we might have briefly talked about, about it last time, uh, but I hadn't posted the photos last time. Uh, it was it was great in in that it was a road trip where we had no set agenda, so we just decided each day where we were going to wind up the next day, and uh, uh, well, we just had a general outline and knew we wanted to be back in about two weeks, and that's it. Uh, and so yeah, and so uh, I took uh, as as the article that you're referring to pointed out, this was probably the first um, big trip that I've taken since I decided to give up my point and shoot camera and just go with the iPhone, and. Um, and so I did. And in fact, I went this time without any other lenses. We talked in a previous time about I had some old, old clip uh, um, telephoto lens that I was using. I actually <laughs> don't tell old clip, or maybe tell them. I lost it uh, somehow. Oh. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I don't know what happened. I, I put it in my pocket, and later in the day, it wasn't in my pocket. Uh, and I've never found it again. So uh, I just decided rather than get another lens at this point with the iPhone 6 around the corner, I just decided to wait and see how it all shakes out. Um, <clears throat> so I, I went with just the iPhone. Uh, and uh, and so I thought uh, it might be fun to share with people who were interested, all three people, <laughs> whatever. You were one of them, apparently, um, how, how, the, how well the iPhone can do as a camera. And so I cherry-picked about 10 of the best pictures that I took uh, and put them on, on the blog, yeah. First of all, on behalf of the person who found your Olo clip lens, thank you. Uh, I'm sure somebody's enjoying it right now. Ted, did you find the experience of using the iPhone limiting? Did you miss your point and shoot uh, at all? Uh, the only time I've missed a point and shoot, and it gets back to what we talked about before, is um, is for zoom lenses. Uh, there were times, um, especially like for taking animal shots, there were there was a, sh a point where we saw some. Um, harbor seals, uh, I believe they were, uh, that, that were uh, on the rocks some distance away. It was actually one point where we saw um, a whale breaching, uh, and there was another point where we saw some elk in the distance, uh, and all of it was hopeless for me to take a picture of. You know, if I took a picture of the whale breaching, assuming I could even time it to, to, to take the picture for when the whale came out, out of the water, all you'd see is an expanse of ocean. And I'd have to, you know, say, well, if you get a, take a magnifying glass and look over here, <laughs> you can see that little bit of water splash. That's the whale. You know, that would be about as good as you could do. Uh, whereas with a decent telephoto lens, I could have really zoomed in on it. Uh, and there were a couple of other cases like that where I might have liked uh, to have the, the, the other camera. Um, but um, overall, I'd say, unless it was important to me, uh, those animal shots. You know, I'm back here now. I don't have those animal shots. Do I really care? No, not really. It's not, it wasn't like the most important photographs I wanted to take in the trip. So, you know, if my goal was obviously to go and get pictures of, of, of animal life because National Geographic hired me to do, do it or something like that, uh, yeah, then I'd have to take something else along. Uh, but, uh, but for just vacation photos, it did fine. Uh, and, and, the, and generally speaking, you know, I could just move my body to compensate for not having in a telephoto lens. You know, I just found myself moving closer to the subject rather than just turning the dial on a zoom lens. So I got a little extra exercise and step back, step forward. You know, so, uh, and and it, it's surprisingly good. I mean, compare, the, the, the Canon that I had was a few years old, and I think 
for just straight shots where the iPhone was perfectly adequate, the iPhone actually shot steadily even better than the, than the shots I took with the uh, with the Canon when I was using the Canon. <clears throat> Right. I managed to break the can, actually, and I think I mentioned that in the article. Um, maybe, maybe some some hidden um, strategy there. But I, but at one point, uh, I was carrying. I, we took it, even though I wasn't going to use it. My wife was uh, Naomi was going to use it. Uh, and at one point, I, I put it in my back pocket uh, and it just stayed in my back pocket all day because I wasn't using it. And Naomi didn't want it much that day. Uh, and then I took it out of my back pocket at the end of the day, and the LCD screen was completely cracked. And, and no longer functioning. At one point, I must have just sat wrong and cracked the screen. Ouch! I can think of lots of puns there about uh, sitting on things with a crack, and but uh, <clears throat> but we we'll, won't we'll go there. <clears throat> well, yeah, let's not. Let's not. Ted, this kind of takes us in the direction of something else we were talking about pre-show, and that is the, the way that Apple handles their phone releases, and and notably, we we're onto this because of the cameras. And, and sometimes I wonder, does this stuff change so fast that Apple should change their release schedule, be a little more like Sam, uh, sorry folks, but be a little more like Samsung uh, to try to keep up? Or is it adequate and is it a better idea for the consumer to say, this is what we've got for now and you can look forward to a better one next year? Well, I obviously can't speak for everyone, but I personally like the way Apple does it better to a certain extent. Uh, and I'll get to the extent in a minute. I like that Apple has a very limited number of models. Uh, that appeals to me. I like that I don't, when it comes time, you know, suppose I decide, if I was, suppose I was new to the Apple community and, and woke up one morning and said, that's it, I'm getting an Apple iPhone. I'm going to the Mac store and, or Apple store and getting one. Uh, and I get there and I find that there's 30 different types of iPhones to buy. And I don't mean just hard drive size. I mean, uh, 30 actual different models with with serial numbers for names. Did you want the, you know, the the Apple W3 4027 or the or the Apple AX 1392 or whatever? And, and what's the difference? Well, I mean, uh, and 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 all that stuff. I hate all that stuff. Uh, so the the idea that Apple just has two models, maybe sometimes even one, with some clear steps in terms of, of, of features, and that's it, is real appealing to me. I also think it works well in terms of the operating system. Uh, just actually, just the fact that Apple makes the hardware and the and the software helps in that regard too. But even so, it helps that that you now know that you know Apple can say that this this iPhone works with this software, and you know that you're going to be able to you know if you have an, an iPhone five, you have an iPhone six when it comes out, uh, you know that you're going to be able to use the latest software, and there's no. Question: You don't have to get into this ice cream sandwich gingerbread business and wonder whether it's going to work with your phone and uh, and and have different variations of, of, of Android software and all that sort of stuff. So I, I, I like that as well. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, and now it gets starting to drift a little bit into the, where it doesn't always work out so well, but I think it generally works out well in that Apple strategy seems to be we're going to give you the best that we can do this year. And that's it. If it isn't ready for prime time, it'll wait till next year. Uh, if if we think we haven't quite nailed it, it'll wait till next year. With obviously some exceptions, some people will probably already you know send off an email. What about Apple Maps? That didn't seem ready for prime time when chip um, and you know it's the stuff like that. Yeah, the, the Apple is not perfect, but but I think the general idea is uh, you know if if. If, if they're working on something and they say, okay, you know, this is it, this is the, the, the cut bait day and, and we either we're going to ship it or we're not, and they say, no, it's not ready, then that means it's not going to be there for another year. Uh, and I think the good part about that is, is you don't get a lot of crap. Uh, and that, that gets into what you were saying about the telephoto lens, you know, uh, uh, a zoom lens, I should say. Uh, I would love to have a built-in zoom lens on an iPhone. It's, it's the, as I've said many times now, that's the single biggest thing about the iPhone camera that I find to be a limitation. I've always, it's always struck me, how can you do it? Well, most zoom lens have to zoom out of the camera. You know, you would lose, you would lose the, the flat, thin nature of the camera when the zoom ends out. And I'm not sure, and it'll be a mechanical back and forth. I'm not sure, you know, could, could Apple do it and maintain the sort of quality and aesthetic standards that they otherwise want in their iPhone? I'm not sure, which is probably why they haven't done it yet. And so until they can nail it, is my attitude, they're not going to do it. You can be, I can be pretty confident that when Apple, if and when, and maybe never, if and when Apple comes out with a zoom lens, it'll be spectacular. 
another another company, and Samsung seems to be an example here, can take a very different approach and say, we're going to come out with a zoom lens camera, even if it's pretty mediocre, even if it sort of sucks. I don't think they would say it that way, but 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 I could say it that way. And the attitude can be, you know, there are all these people like Ted Lando who claim that they want a camera with a zoom lens. Let's give them a camera with a zoom lens. Maybe Ted Lando and all his uh, people like him will buy one. Uh, and and if they and if it and if it busts, if that model isn't a big success, it doesn't matter so much to Samsung because they can hope that you'll buy a different Samsung instead. Samsung has thirty different iPhone models, you know, and maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but certainly a lot of different iPhone models uh, that, that you could try, uh, and not to mention all the different non-Samsung uh, Android models that, that, that are out there, but even within Samsung, there are a lot of different models that you can try. Uh, and so it's, it's more, Samsung takes more of a, you know, throw it against the wall, see if it sticks approach. If it doesn't stick, well, on to the next model. Uh, and um, I don't like that. So again, I come to liking Apple's approach better. The one place where, where I feel it is unfortunate is, is uh, you know, hypothetically, suppose Apple, you know, so it's getting close to the time that the iPhone 6 is going to come out. Suppose they say, okay, August 1st is the drop dead date. If, if you can't, you know, they go to their engineers and they say, if you can't tell us that it's going to be good to go by August 1st, we're not including it in the iPhone this year. They've probably already gotten past that point, but let's make it up and say that that's the case. Well, August 1st goes around. They say, no, this isn't quite ready. And they say, okay, we're not going to include it, um, whatever, it whatever feature we're talking about. And then August 15th, two weeks later, they figure out how to do it. Well, what do they do at that point? I mean, in theory, that means even though it's now ready, even though the iPhone 6 hasn't come out yet, and even though they figured out the perfect solution, we now have to wait another 12 months before we can see it on an iPhone because of the way Apple structures their schedule. Uh, you know, to me, that's not good, especially if other companies similarly nail it. And you know, suppose Samsung now comes out with this feature in October uh, or September, whatever, um, uh, when same time that Apple's iPhone 6 comes out, and and Samsung has this feature, and the iPhone doesn't, and and people say, well, what's Apple's answer? And you say, well, you have to wait till late 2015 for Apple's answer. Uh, I think that isn't good. Uh, when things like that happen, I wish there were times when Apple could uh, maybe come out with some sort of interim update that adds new features that they think you know are good to go to try to stay competitive. Because there is a, it's a rapidly it's the nature of technology. It's a rapidly changing market, uh, and you can't count on once a year as being um, uh, a, a reliable schedule to to stay up to date with the competition. Ted, do we know if, if that particular scenario has ever played itself out, that there was something that maybe two weeks, a month, whatever, after the, the cutoff date for the next iPhone, that there was something that happened in technology that Apple wanted to include, and we can confirm it wasn't included until the next year? I, I, not, not that I can think of right now. I haven't given it any thought. I mean, may, maybe if you'd asked me this question yesterday, I'd think about it, and I'd have a better answer for you now. But, but off the top of my head, no, I can't think of it. Yeah, I... I I can't think of one. I guess there's there are things that well, of course, every time we we get to this time of year, all the analysts pop out and say, "Oh my God, if Apple does not include X or Y, then they're doomed." You know, the the iPhone is doomed, and it never seems to work. Last year, if I remember correctly, Nearfield Communication NFC was the big thing that if Apple didn't include this, oh my God. And you know, I just don't see it. I don't see NFC being widely adopted. It, it, it's almost like sometimes the analysts and occasionally the pundits, they just need something to, to throw out or project or predict and then comment on. And that's really not the way Apple does things. I, I think any analyst who uses the word Apple and doom in the same sentence ought to turn his, in his credentials at this point. It just, it's just such a tired thing, and it's never turned out to be true, and it probably will never turn out to be true, um, that, that I just – Ignore all those things. But I will think, you know, I, in the background, I've been thinking one thing that that, that might fit in that category um, is the is the larger screen iPhone, not the projected ones, but the one that's already out now, the four inch one that replaced the three point five inch original screen. That uh, uh, Android phones had larger screens for I think for at least 
and again, I haven't researched this, so I'm talking off the top of my head, but had larger screens for at least a year before that came out. And for the longest time, people were clamoring, when's Apple going to come out with a larger screen iPhone? The 3.5 inch is just too small. And sure enough, they did eventually move up to the 4 inch, which made a difference. But I think it was rather late. And, and my guess is that if they were coming out with iPhones twice a year, that they could have come out with a larger screen six months sooner than they did. Now, how much of a difference it made in terms of Apple's marketing success over the <laughs> ensuing years, that's a whole different story. I'm not sure. And I still, it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, if, if the iPhone 6 comes out in a larger model, how large a model, and what are the differentiating characteristics of that larger model and of the iPhone 6 itself. Um, I, I just, mm. there are times, Ted, I don't know about you, but I still, I look at these people with these, almost Mac mini size things in their hands. And it's like, I, I see some definite advantages. I see a lot of disadvantages too. Well, yes. Um, I have a couple of friends that have these super large phones and, and I, <laughs> my first surprise was they actually got it into their pocket. <laughs> as large as it was, it, yep. it fit in their, I'm not sure that they could sit down anymore once it's in their pocket, um, but it was in their pocket. Uh, so that was impressive. Uh, it, it just, every time they use it, it seems too large for me for a phone. When, when they put it to the ear to take a phone call, it always looks a little silly to me. That it's like putting an iPad to your ear to make a phone call. It just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, fit my image of what it should look like. So I think it, and it's awkward for things. But I have read a couple of articles now that suggest that one byproduct of these larger phones is that it eliminates the need to have a phone and a tablet. That you're pointing out, in fact, in your very language, you said almost Mac mini, uh, mini iPad uh, uh, size tablet. Well, to the extent that it is like an iPad mini uh, tablet, it, why do you need an iPad mini then if you have the super large phone? Uh, well, in Apple's case, you might want it. It depends on how Apple positions the software because there's iPad-specific software that's much nicer on a larger screen than the iPhone software. And if the larger iPhone still uses the iPhone software instead of the iPad software, that's significant. Uh, but uh, uh, that aside, um, it does raise the issue of, you know, at what point do you need both those devices when these iPhones get to be as big or when these smartphones get to be as big as they are? Personally, uh, I mean, I, I'm not even I, – I don't use – uh, the Mac Mini. I like the larger, the the iPad Air, uh, and so there's no way that anything that fits in my pocket will be an adequate substitute for a tablet for, for me for for the foreseeable future. Anyway, probably as my vision continues to go as I get older, it'll never happen. Um, but but for for younger people and for people who um, money is more of an issue than it is for me, and and would welcome not having to spend the extra eight nine. Hundred dollars on a on a second tablet than just make their phone do. Um, I could see where larger larger phones will eat into tablet sales significantly. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPhone, PDF Pen for iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at SmileSoftware.com. If you're like me, you're doing some traveling this summer, and that means a lot of receipts for food, supplies, and all those things you need when you're away from home. And that means lots of annoying little slips of paper that you have to keep track of, not just so you know what you spent when and where, but also because of any information they might contain that could compromise your identity. And in case you need to return that Hawaiian shirt that you just had to have last Tuesday, but now realize it wasn't a good idea. PDF Pen Scan Plus to the rescue. With PDF Pen Scan Plus, your iPhone turns into a mobile scanner, capable of capturing those receipts to PDF files so you can dispose of them safely and securely. But that's not all. Using optical character recognition, you can turn those PDF files into editable, searchable documents, so you can find what you need when you need it. But that's not all. Upload those PDFs to Evernote, Dropbox, Google Docs, Box, and other cloud services, so they won't have to take up any space on your phone. Of course, PDF Pen Scan Plus doesn't just do receipts. Any document you can capture with your iPhone's camera can be captured by PDF Pen Scan Plus, so you can keep permanent records of all sorts of things without having to keep the paper. PDF Pen Scan Plus can be found on the iOS App Store. Get it now and add one more powerful capability to your iPhone and iPad. You'll be glad you did. 
PDF Pen Scan Plus is just another example of the world-class software produced by Smile. Thanks to Smile for their support of Mac Voices. Again, you know, I, I see some advantages. I see some disadvantages. I, it'll be interesting to see just how much of the large phone mythos Apple buys into, and how they will how they will spin it. How they will maybe try to take advantage of a larger screen on your on your phone device as opposed to your tablet device. Mm -hmm. So, all this talk of phones, the Amazon Fire mm -hmm. is, is out. And everything that I've seen, and I think you said everything that you've seen, has just not been glowing. Um, I know the the one review I read, it, it said it seemed to be more more designed to try to sell you more stuff as opposed to for, for really being, you know, a great phone type device. Where do, where do you stand on the fire? Does it is it is it relevant? Does it matter? Well, I, I except for seeing it once in the store, I haven't spent much time with it, so I, I don't want to comment like I reviewed it or anything like that. It's not fair to the device. I, I've read the reviews. Uh, you know, I've read reviews that suggested beyond what you're saying, things like you know, it has some gimmicks that aren't really that practical, and and the basic stuff doesn't work that well. Um, and so, uh, as a phone in that regard, not as good as well. As well. Uh, I, I mean, a couple of things. First, I think. I'll go out a little bit on a limb here. I think it's too late. Uh, I would count Amazon out. Amazon's a little bit like Microsoft was years ago, where if the product stinks the first time around, Amazon is so big, it doesn't matter. They'll just keep improving it, improving it, improving it until you know three or four years from now, it'll be a competitive product, and they can afford to wait because they're they're so huge. Of course, they seem to. <laughs> While they're huge, on the other hand, I'm getting sidetracked here, but while they're huge, they're, they're not making much money. Their, their latest financial results show that they were losing money. So maybe they can't be quite as uh, um, casual about it as I'm suggesting. Uh, but but um, I, aside, aside from Amazon sticking it out because they're so big, I think, uh, you know, the ship has sailed. Uh, it's just like, you know, there's no operating system that's going to come along anymore that's going to replace Windows and OS X that, that we're... Basically, well, a little bit Linux there in the background, but basically, we, we there's OS OS 10 and and Windows, and that's it. And for the foreseeable future, that's all there's going to be for computers. And I think we've just about approached that point for um, mobile devices as well. It, there's Android, uh, and there's iOS, uh, and uh, and th that's basically it. And and while Amazon is sort of running an Android phone, I understand that it, it's one that's been highly um, camouflaged uh, and to the point where it's hard to recognize that's an Android phone. So, um, anyway, I'm just thinking that to trying to, as, as Microsoft is doing with a totally different I, uh, mobile operating system, I think they're in the same position, trying to struggle against the dominant forces, which I think is going to be really hard. That said, I mean, the other issue that I, we were talking about before the show was I found myself reading these reviews criticizing the Amazon Fire and alternately either breathing a sigh of relief or quietly cheering, you know, saying, you know, Apple dodged another bullet. We don't have to, with these reviews, we don't have to worry about the Amazon fire killing the iPhone uh, and, uh, and things like that. And then it occurred to me, you know, number one, why do I feel that way? And number two, is, is it reasonable for me to feel that way? Uh, the why is, I think I can sort of, sort of answer. I mean, w one is, I'm heavily invested in Apple, not financially. I'm not talking about here, but but it's an ecosystem. You know, I've known nothing but Apple product. I've owned nothing but Apple products since 1984, uh, and uh, I have. I'm into the whole Apple ecosystem, all their their app store and so on, the interconnectedness of all their devices, uh, and so it would be if if for some you know if for some app. Um, apocalyptic reason uh, a phone was able to you know drive Apple into extinction and get to that doom that we were talking about before um, it would be a major loss for me because everything that I own <laughs> from a technology point of view would, would then be orphaned uh, and so I'm not hoping that's going to happen uh, <clears throat> and, and on top of that I think Apple makes great products and I'd hate to think that some company would make a product that I thought in significant ways was inferior uh, uh, and um, or, or a company who, in general, made inferior products, even if this particular product w was an exception, uh, and, and that would then cause trouble for a company that has consistently put out great products over the years. 
Uh, but with all that said, so I, I can make a reasonable case for why it makes sense for me to root for Apple. Um, <clears throat> but all that said, uh, I'm still a little uncomfortable, especially as a quote unquote journalist, which I sometimes think of myself, uh, that I have such a biased view. I mean, in theory, and even, even as a user, I mean, in theory, uh, you know, if some company could come out with a smartphone that just, you know, blew the, the wind out of the sails, you know, hit, hit the home run, whatever metaphor you want to use, w was so much uh, improved over the current, current phone situation that it was, it was like the iPhone coming out. Uh, you know, the iPhone was so dramatically advanced and different from all existing smartphones that were out there that, you know, in a matter of years, the BlackBerry is uh, practically gone, uh, uh, and which was the dominant phone at the time. Well, if someone could come out with a phone that was so much better than an iPhone that it was like that, why should I be against that uh, in, in principle? I mean, don't I want uh, technology to advance like that? Isn't part of the reason I cheer Apple is because they do things like that? And if some other company could do it as well or better, then I should cheer for that other company. Uh, and so I have some amb ambivalence about the, the whole thing. Uh, that's basically so far. I haven't seen another company duplicate what Apple does, so I'm on pretty safe ground. But I do worry in principle about about being too biased towards Apple, and maybe that's not a good idea. I don't think you. <clears throat> pardon me. I don't think you need to be worried about it. Uh, you're intelligent. I like to think I'm intelligent. If somebody builds a better mousetrap, you're going to you're going to go with the better mousetrap. I think the problem is that in so many cases. They, the other companies, and you know, let's we can pick on the Amazon Kindle Fire phone, if, if as the latest one, they try to sell us the the innovations um, that they're supposed to be the, ne the next best thing. They really don't add anything to the conversation. They really don't add any capabilities that we can use. There might be something that's interesting. There might be something that's a little useful, but the scales never tip significantly in the other direction and so, and I I don't claim to be a journalist I do claim to be an Apple fan mm -hmm. but it's because I'm a fan of great products mm -hmm. not everything Apple has done has perfect. has started out perfect let's let's get that out of the way like you say Apple Maps is the more the most recent poster shot for that but usually you know I guess they have a higher percentage chance of introducing something useful and good that I will that will benefit me, as opposed to a Samsung who brings out a new model phone every month, trying to catch either the what the the, the most recent available tech is, or you know tr tweak something that they think might be interesting just to differentiate themselves. Mm -hmm. I think it's that record of excellence that that we both appreciate, and a lot of the people that listen to the show appreciate. Yeah, I mean, you have to, I agree, you have to pay attention to the fundamentals of the device, not just the latest doodad. I mean, I'm trying to think of an analogy while you were talking, and I, I don't have a perfect one. It would be like as, as if a cold cereal came out and said, we've sweetened our cold cereal with maple syrup. And maybe no one ever had done that before, just making this up. And said, so, wow, maple syrup, that sounds cool. I like maple syrup on my pancakes. And maple syrup sweetened cereal sounds great. You know, it's the only one. If you want maple syrup sweetened cereal, you got to get that one. And that would be a selling point, except when you actually buy it, you find that the cereal that's underneath the maple syrup sucks. Uh, it's the worst tasting garbage ever. The fact that it has the maple syrup almost becomes irrelevant. And, and I sometimes think that technology can be like that as well, where there's some great new feature that the advertisements tout, you know, we're the only phone that can do this. Uh, and, and it sounds great until you find out that the fundamentals that you need with the phone, making a phone call, browsing the web, uh, uh, and, and things like that, uh, checking your email, uh, the, the fundamentals aren't there. And so the, 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 the maple syrup feature doesn't really matter all that much. That's an interesting term, the maple syrup feature. <laughs> work, work that into a column, Ted. I, I've copyrighted that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, think back to, now I can't even remember what it was called because it burned so bright in the media and then died. But the Facebook... Uh, app or function that was going to be the, the the home screen of your phone, and this is going to you know revolutionize everything. Not only did it not revolutionize anything, it it died and was abandoned faster than just about anything I think I can remember. Yeah, it was a complete failure. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So no, I I don't think you need to worry too much about your your Apple bias. 
Okay, let me just make a note. Chuck says... Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> You'll get my bill. Okay. Okay, I'm going to just hand this note to people if they claim I'm asking anyway. <laughs> Chuck says I'm not. So take it up with him. <laughs> Ted, another article you recently wrote was recovering deleted notes on Apple's notepad. And I think we both agreed we don't want to try to go through all the all the steps. Folks, yeah. we'll point folks to the article, and folks, you can find the link in the show notes. But is this similar to some other methods of re of recovering deleted items from, say, the, the the Finder on the Mac, or maybe even a, a memory card? Well, it's a little different, and that's what led me to write the article. Uh, if you say you're working in a typical application like Pages, Apple application, uh, if you if you delete something and select save before you realize it, and now you want to get that stuff back, there are lots of easy ways. Uh, certainly, before you select save, there are lots of easy ways. So you can just do a revert to saved command, and that will take it back. Uh, if, uh, so if you haven't saved it and it hasn't been auto saved, you're in good luck. If you have saved it. Well, you, there might still be an older version that you have on your desk somewhere that, that you save separately. Maybe you use save as. And back to an old, you can go back to an older version, uh, and you, you could check quickly in Time Machine to get back to an older version if you, if you have a Time Machine backup. Uh, there's, and, of course, even if you deleted an entire document and moved it to the trash, if you haven't emptied the trash yet, it's easy to get it out of the trash before, you know, before you've made that irrevocable step. And so basically, uh, there's a lot of safeguards that are built in um, to your your system when you're saving work in an application like Pages so that if you accidentally delete something or an entire document that you didn't intend to, you can get it back. And, and certainly, and I mean, another aspect of it is, is if you have the copy of the document someplace else on another device, backup external drive, your laptop and your main computer, there's another way in which you, you know, might want to delete it from your main computer while it's still on your laptop and so on. Um, <clears throat> situation with notes is a bit different. When you delete a note, uh, and there, there's no save, there's no save as, there's no duplicate, there, there's there's no, um, uh, it doesn't go to the trash can, there's none of that stuff. Uh, if you delete a note and then suddenly decide that you didn't mean to delete it, maybe, maybe, maybe you accidentally deleted note 2 and you meant to delete note 3, and you say, oh my god, I deleted note 2. That's not the one I wanted to delete, I want that one back. Well, if the undo command isn't going to make it for you anymore, and it often doesn't, what do you do with notes? I mean, it, there's no, there's no way, there's no system that easily tells you how to get it back. Uh, even if you wanted to use Time Machine to find an older version, where, where do you go in Time Machine? Where are those notes stored? That, that is not made apparent either. Uh, so, and, and of course, if you, and the fact that these notes sync in iCloud, which is normally a good thing, because it makes it easy to make a note in on your Mac, say, and then have that same information being nearly instantly available on your iPhone can become a headache here because now you say, oh my god, I deleted it from my Mac. Well, maybe it's still on my iPhone. <laughs> Get your iPhone out and it vanishes <laughs> from, from your iPhone the moment you try to access it because it's syncing with the change that you made on the Mac. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I said, well, what's other than not using notes, which is what some people have done, uh, you know, what can you do when that happens to get your notes back? Uh, and that's what the article is about. We talked, I think I gave about three or four different strategies and went into, in the course of the article, discussing exactly where notes are stored on your Mac in particular and how you can go there and possibly recover the data. That sounds good. That sounds very, very useful, uh, especially as we get more of these apps that I, I'm not ready to say they, they hide the data, but they put it in places for their own purposes and you're expected to access the data just through that mm -hmm. particular app. It's it's there again advantages and disadvantages, but it can be a little little tough when you're trying to troubleshoot or solve a problem like we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a direction Apple moves more and more because that's the way iOS in, almost entirely works. Yeah. So I've saved our last topic, uh, or, or the best topic, my favorite topic for this discussion for last because I'm really anxious to. You didn't like any other topics? Well, I liked them, but, <laughs> but, but this one is kind of compelling, I think. Okay. Um, and you, that is that you're, you're looking at replacing your Mac Pro, and I said, folks, Mac Pro with a Mac Mini. And that seems to be like on 
the two far ends of the spectrum that you are deciding to replace one with the other. Well, they are in a way. Uh, and uh, we've talked about the Mac Pro situation. I, I have, to, so to be clear, a 2009 Mac Pro, uh, not, not, not the new 2013 Mac Pro. Uh, and the 2009 Mac Pro uh, has been a great machine for me over the years. It, it, I'm still using it. In fact, I'm using it right now. It's the machine that we are communicating on. Uh, it, uh, I've upgraded it with a solid-state drive. Uh, I've expanded it with a, additional hard drives. Uh, it has two optical drives, and despite Apple's uh, getting rid of optical drives, I still use them from time to time, and having two allows me to make copies from one to the other, which is convenient. Uh, and it's fast enough. It still runs the latest version of OS X uh, in a reasonable speed. Uh, and so um, I'm quite happy with it. But it is getting older. Um, it is still a big behemoth. It still generates a lot of heat uh, uh, and doesn't have any Thunderbolt ports. And um, it, it, it's not as fast, uh, it's not even as fast as the current IMAX. And you know, if I really cared about speed and wanted something significantly faster, um, it would be time to get something new. And I know the time is approaching when either, you know, the machine is now five years old. The time is now approaching when either the machine breaks down to the point where it isn't worth repairing, or Apple's going to say the latest version of the operating system no longer works on this Mac, or, or there's going to be some technological advance that I really want that, that isn't available for this Mac. So, I, I mean, the clock is ticking. I know that in the next maybe two years at most, one of those things is going to happen, and I'm going to have to break down and get a new Mac. Not that it requires a lot to get me to break down and get a new Mac. <laughs> uh, uh, I think if the wind changes direction, I can break down and get a new Mac. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> so I started thinking, well, what do I want? Well, for reasons that we've discussed before, we don't have to go into this. Well, back when the new Mac Pro came out, we discussed why my next Mac is almost certainly, and I can at this point say certainly not going to be uh, the 2013 version of the Mac Pro. As spectacular as it is, it's just overkill beyond belief for me. Uh, not only is it more than I need, but the reviews, including in, in Macworld, suggested that for the sort of everyday tasks that I use, and using applications like iMovie and uh, and uh, and uh, Photoshop and so on, th that um, it, the new Mac Pro can actually be slower than an iMac. It's only when you're really doing stuff that requires the 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 multiple core uh, features of the Mac Pro that it's, that it shines, which I don't anticipate doing very much. And on top of that, of course, it can quickly get exceedingly expensive to get a, a souped-up Mac Pro and a new monitor and so on. So I said, no, Mac Pro is not for me. And, and so what do I do instead? Well, the, the obvious choice, which is what many people have done, is get an iMac. And that may, in fact, be what I do. Uh, I'm waiting to see what the next generation iMac is, is going to be. I'm hoping that they have a major feature update as opposed to the sort of um, little tiny updates that they've had for a while. Uh, and I might just get an iMac. The, the, one, the key thing I don't like about an iMac is, I, and maybe it's because of all my years using a Mac Pro, but I don't like having the, the monitor and the computer as one unit. Uh, I like the idea that if you know if I if I don't like the monitor and a new monitor comes out in 2014 and 2015 that I like better, I can sell my old monitor and get a new monitor without having to um, without having to get a new computer because it's not, they're not linked together, and that I can have multiple monitors um, without having one monitor be the 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 one that's a part of the computer. Uh, <clears throat> and so I what I really like is a headless Mac, like a Mac Pro, that isn't as fancy and as expensive as a Mac Pro. Uh, well, the only thing that Apple makes that's like that is the Mac Mini. The problem with the Mac Mini for, for me is that when I looked at it, the specs for the Mac Mini weren't even nearly as good as the iMac, never mind the Mac Pro. But if you, if you do a point-by-point -point comparison, if you look at the, in particular, if you look at the best iMac, the most expensive iMac you could get, and the most expensive Mac Mini you could get, the Mac Mini falls way behind uh, on almost every measure. Uh, and so, that, I mean, even if I, even if, you know, some, even if I could convince myself that the Mac Mini was good enough, even with those inferior specs, it's just part of <laughs> my internal says, well, I, you know, I'm not going to spend the $1,000 on a computer to get something that isn't even as good as an iMac. 
uh, you know, I did, so I said, you know, from before I could go and you know, finally plunk down money and get and get a Mac Mini, Apple needs to update the Mac Mini so it's at least on a par with an iMac. And the article goes on to discuss, you know, why they haven't done that already, whether they will do it, and, and that's the gist of the article. Is it something, Ted, that you would recommend to to someone who has, let's say, average needs and maybe a limited budget, or is it precluded? Is is that option just not available because you have to buy a monitor to to feed the Mac Mini or to to, to view the Mac Mini? If you're going to have to buy a monitor, uh, and you buy a monitor like the Apple Thunderbolt display uh, in that price range, the Mac Mini isn't cheaper than the iMac. Uh, that's another thing I priced out for the article. If I tried to, if I tried to match the specs of the Mac Mini as closely as I could to the iMac, in other words, it got a Thunderbolt display, got the same amount of memory, got the same size drive, and so on, uh, and I matched the specs, I had, you know, I couldn't get the top of the line iMac, like I said, because that would be better than, than the Mac Mini could do. But I dropped down the spec, the, the, the iMac, to match the Mac Mini's uh, best best specs, and the prices I think were like fifty or seventy five dollars apart. So um, you don't really save money. Um, but yes, if you were willing to get a much cheaper monitor or you already had a monitor uh, that you were happy with and a keyboard and a trackpad and so on, uh, then yeah, get, making, getting the Mac Mini saves you money because the, the iMac comes with those things whether you want it or not. With the Mac Mini, you don't have to pay for it. So once again, we seem to wait on things to catch up for what we want. Yeah, Apple certainly has not doesn't doesn't seem to be catering to people who have my particular <laughs> interest in in the, in the future Mac. But I, I you know one of one of the re, one of the arguments you'll hear people say well, is you know why why aren't they pushing the Mac Mini more? You know here I am sitting on the sidelines is one of the things I said in the article with my Mac Pro, maybe keeping it for another year or two. Whereas if Apple had a competitive Mac Mini, I'd probably buy one tomorrow. Uh, and so they're losing that sale because of because of that, and and you know so why you know why don't they um, improve it so that people like me will get rid of our old Mac Pros and generate a new sale for Apple? And I and my guess is the answer there is there aren't enough people like me um, that that Apple finds that that you know the iMac uh, and 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 more especially the desktop of course desktop Macs are the minority right now anyway I mean, most of Apple's Mac sales are are laptops MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs and uh, and then among the desktops the iMacs are clearly doing just fine and so App, Apple you know if Apple makes less money on a Mac Mini than it does on an iMac they may not be in a hurry to generate more Mac Mini sales because uh, it just means less money for them if most people will wind up buying the iMac instead. And isn't it ironic that, you know, while we're talking about this, one of Apple's most recent successes has been with what a lot of us would term an underpowered MacBook Air. Yeah. Well, they didn't figure it out. There, there's, there's certainly a market for saving money, and there's certainly a case to be made for, for saving money if you don't need the power that the extra money would get you. Yeah. More wit, more wisdom, more the third W next time, Ted? Wash. Wash? Yeah, in case you need to do laundry, we'll take care of it for you. Okay, well, that's good. That's okay, and folks. Next time, we'll meet in my laundry room. <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can stretch the mics in there. Okay. Hey, Ted, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much, as always, for the time. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me, as always. We'll do it again. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. That's Ted Landau. All the links to all of Ted's articles that he wrote that we talked about in this. This session will be in the show notes uh, for this version. I couldn't put all the notes to links to everything he ever wrote because the internet's not that big. I gave up trying to do that as well. Yeah, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. 
Bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com. The oh. clock? No, um, sorry. My, my phone is vibrating in my pocket, and it's like, what's that? That was fun. Uh, well, at least something is vibrating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not going there. Not going, not going there at all. <laughs>